Kia ora, good evening. Two people have been shot dead at a work and income office in Ashburton this morning. Police are on the lookout for 48-year-old John Henry Tully in relation to the armed incident that killed two Wynn staff and seriously injured another. Mr Tully is a person of interest to police and staff are still working to locate him. Police say he should not be approached and any sightings should be reported immediately to police via 111. Two South and hockey teams remain holed up in accommodation while Tully is still at large. Meanwhile, two 36-year-old men are being sought by Southern Police in relation to a series of burglaries. Noel Karora and Paul Tippany, both aged 36, are wanted in connection with recent burglaries in the Otago, Dunedin and Southland areas. The pair have been staying in motels and hotels in the southern area and committing burglaries. Both men are believed to be travelling in either a green 1994 Nissan Skyline, a silver 94 Subaru Legacy Saloon or a blue 2001 Subaru Legacy Saloon. Police are asking anyone with information to contact their nearest police station on 111 or Crime Stoppers on 0800 555 111. Leaving empty schools boarded up and open to vandalism is just not good enough, according to Labor's education spokesperson Chris Hipkins. Mr Hipkins was visiting a number of Southern schools today and says if if elected, Labour would act quickly to clean up deserted schools in the province. I spoke to him about Labour's three main education elements, charter schools and the rejection of National's $350 million education policy by teachers. We want to lower class sizes in all primary and in the large secondary schools so that uh, teachers can have more one-on-one -on -one time with kids and those sorts of things. Uh, we want to increase school funding so that they're not beholden to uh, parental donations in the way that they are now. And we want to make sure that all kids uh, from year five onwards have access to electronic devices, you know, whether it be a laptop or a tablet, because it's the 21st century and that's what they're going to need uh, to, in order to be able to learn in a modern learning environment. So, uh, you know, we want to make sure that all kids have got access to those things. We've got a variety of other smaller aspects to the policy as well, but those would be the, the headlines issues. As, as far as charter schools go, what are your thoughts on them? Uh, we've made it really clear we don't see a need for charter schools. Um, we've got too many schools in the state school system at the moment in some places uh, and simply increasing competition by building new schools in areas where we don't need them uh, it's just going to result in more school closures, uh, it's going to result in more trauma for local communities. Uh, let's focus on making sure that the schools that we've got now are the best that they possibly can be. Just on schools that uh, have been closed, we've, we had uh, undergone a, a major education review in Southland a number of years ago. These schools are still still sitting empty. What, what would be the plan for them? I think the reality is once schools have closed, we need to move really quickly to ascertain whether there's another community use for the site, and if there's not, then it should be sold or the building should be demolished. But simply leaving old school buildings boarded up with plywood so that they're open to vandalism, that's not OK. And it's a real tragedy, actually. So I think we need to move really quickly to identify what's going to happen to those sites and get on with it. Why do you believe they are being held up and taking so long to, to move on? I think the Ministry of Education have been very, very slow. It's not just the Ministry of Education. I think the disposal process itself is very slow because there's the offer back to original landowners and uh, then there's the issue of treaty settlements and all of those things in there as well. But I think we need to really put our foot on the accelerator and put a lot of pressure on uh, to make sure that a future is identified for these buildings and these sites, even if it's not resolved overnight, we at least need to get some decisions so that people know what's going to happen uh, because just simply leaving them the way they are is just not good enough. Uh, finally, your thoughts on the response to uh, the rejection of the $350 million suggestion from National to um, put some top heavy, heavy pay rises into the principals? I think the um, really important issue for us is to make sure we're improving the quality in all schools and supporting all teachers to be the very best that they can be. Handpicking a bunch of teachers and paying them a significant amount of extra money over and above what their peers are going to be paid isn't going to do that. It's going to create a sort of a competitive environment amongst teachers when actually we want them to be cooperating and collaborating with each other. Were you surprised at that response from teachers? Well, I think it's a clear signal that teachers are actually more concerned about what's going to be good for education than they are about their own back pockets. And I think that's a really positive sign. It's saying that teachers really want to make sure that we're targeting the extra money to the areas where it can make the biggest difference. Exports were down for the June 2014 quarter at 5.4%. It's the largest quarterly fall in over six years. Export volumes dropped 5.3% with seasonally adjusted meat and forestry volumes both down 8.3% while dairy dropped 2%.
A strengthening New Zealand dollar had a downward influence on export and import prices, with export prices down 2% and the prices for imported goods down 2.3%, according to Statistics New Zealand. Do stay with us after the break. The power of the blogger plus a weekend wrap. Welcome back. Writers nationwide have taken to the blogging versus journalism debate as controversy surrounding whale oil blogger Cameron Slater's involvement with the National Party continues. Our reporter Sharon Rees spoke to local blogger and journalist tutor Paddy Lewis about how influential bloggers can be. Is blogging for you a case of delivering news or delivering an opinion? Uh, it's a bit of both. It's more, I like to think of it more as um, bringing things to light. And so in my case, I try and make sure that uh, I have as much information as I can. Um, but of course, there's always opinion in there as well, so I can't help myself. As someone with a long journalist background, uh, do you think there should be restrictions in place for major bloggers as to how opinionated they should be? I think there's issues around how you do that. Um, and I think it's uh, one of those things that it's people having a, a mostly having a vent online. Um, it's where they hold themselves up as being paragons of truth and everything like that and get caught out that I think there should be some sort of ramification there along the lines of the press council or um, we've got the online media standards authority. So yeah, something like that. One thing that blogs do is they're a lot faster than the uh, major media organisations. Major media organisations are good at breaking news, um, but they haven't really got their heads around uh, online. Um, their online strategies aren't that great. New Zealand Herald's improving, um, but Fairfax, for example, has really doesn't have a clue about online. And so I think blogs sort of fill that gap that they, it's, Whereas newspapers and other media want to check and have things sub-edited and everything like that, you can have a blog post up in five minutes while they're still deciding what they're going to do with the story. Is there any um, blog that you would trust as a viable source of information? There's a few out there, but I think it's up to people to you know, read widely, um, make their own judgments, but make sure that they're not just basing it on one opinion. I'm very big on people making up their own minds and, and it, just looking at the information that's put in front of them and making a rational choice. A group of Verdon College students plan to show how radical they can be as they begin filming for Southland's fourth Rocket Film Festival. Five days of radical living is the theme for this year's festival, which hopes to showcase the talents of Southlanders, including these budding filmmakers. What made you join the film festival? Um. I got a flyer for the workshop, so um, we went along to the workshop and they convinced us to enter the film competition, it seemed pretty interesting. Yeah. What did the workshop entail? It was like, um, it's pretty much getting the main plot of your movie, they, um, they gave us some really good ideas, some like, like a base and then work off the base to get a, a, an idea for a movie. Can you give us an idea of what your film will be about? Um, we were planning on doing a mockumentary sort of thing. And so like five days of radical, we were thinking like, I don't know, radical parkour or something. Radical parkour. parkour. <laughs> and what's that? Jumping off stuff basically. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so what are the stages of creating the film? Uh, well. First of all, you have to start with a um, script, write out the script, that's shots, uh, lines, and then, um, then you start the fun stuff, which is the filming, and um, after you've done all that, you do the editing and publish. So how do you find the time between school and, and your studies to film? Yeah, we just had our mock exams, so those are out of the way, so we've still got the real exams at the end of the year to come. And um, we're doing another film competition at the moment, and that's due on the 12th of September. So we've got um, less than a month to finish that one, then a month after that to go do the rocket. So we're pretty pushed for time, but we did the 48 hour film competition. What other film projects have you worked on in the past? Last year we both entered the Green Screen Awards, which is just the regional one run by 
Environment Southland. And for the last three years, Jamat and I have been entered in the Aleph Sunday. So it's been quite a environmental based conditions. So it's kind of fun to get away from that. Although the environmental side's pretty <laughs> cool, it's good to be a bit more creative in this competition. So what got you into filmmaking in the first place? For me, it was um, they had this wee RE fair um, at school. It's a Catholic school, so we have, um, it's like a competition to promote our values and all that. And uh, we, Tapani and I made a movie and it just enthused us to continue with filmmaking. And those entering the festival will put together a 10 minute long film capturing a five day period of something radical or out of the norm. We're going to take a look at some of the weekend's events now at South New Museum and Art Gallery proved a great venue yesterday for two quite different performances. Mirahiku Polyfest 2014 action continued with several students from St Patrick's School, Pacific Island Senior Group at Invercargill, entertaining with a series of colourful cultural performances. Later in the day, around 30 a cappella singers were accompanied by piano as they performed several short concerts featuring a variety of songs focusing on the seasons and designed to herald the coming of spring. Excel School of Performing Arts students hit the stage in Invercargill on Friday night. A variety concert performing You Are Not Alone featured the latest music, original choreographed hip-hop, contemporary and jazz dance, along with short dramas. The highly energetic and colourful performance is part of a national tour by students who study at the Auckland Christian Arts School. Humorous and surprising perspective on one of New Zealand's worst national tragedies took to the stage in Invercargill on Saturday night. The play Munted is a theatre response to the Canterbury earthquake and shares stories of hope and loss derived entirely from interviews with Cantabrians, media and other Kiwis. Three performers brought to life 15 people on stage finding laughter amongst grief. And miniature model enthusiasts were well catered for over the weekend with the annual Model and Hobby Expo. The Southern Model, model and Modellers Club showcased their talents at the Invercargill Workingmen's Club with massive displays in miniature. Model aircraft, farm machinery, science fiction and movie paraphernalia were all on display as well as a large shot, slot car track modelled on the Bathurst circuit. Patience, a steady hand and imagination make modelling a generational hobby and both young and old alike enjoyed the miniature displays. And that's all from the news desk this Monday. We're back tomorrow at 5.30. Join us then from the news team. Good night.